I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight as we continue this series. You know, when you get along a certain point in a lectureship or a seminar or a summer series, and like your speaker number four, part of your task is don't mess up all the good that's been done until this point in time. But I'm thankful, Brother Jimmy and Brother Martin and Brother Chris, for the invitation to speak tonight. Do you remember what Jesus said about the prophet Jonah? Do you remember that, that he said that, that Jonah went to Nineveh and preached? And specifically, I, I want to know, do you remember what he said about how the people of Nineveh responded? Jesus said at the preaching of Jonah, the men of Nineveh, what did they do? They repented. It's a historical fact. You read that in Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 41. The Old Testament talks about repentance. So does the New Testament. The idea of repentance is part of what the Bible calls the whole counsel of God. And in each of these lessons on Wednesday night this summer, uh, we're considering specific questions. Is there any word from the Lord about, and then the topic is given. Well, tonight we affirm, yes, the Lord has spoken about repentance, and He's spoken loud and clear. I think if people in general, if people in general had a choice to hear a message about grace, love, and heaven, or hear a message about self-control, repentance, and hell, most people, I would think, would choose the grace, love, and heaven route. But as you and I study the entirety of the Bible's message and consider what it says about repentance, that's part of man's proper response to what God says about his love, his grace, and his wonderful place called heaven. And so I hope tonight as we work through this study. I hope that I will have the attitude and you will have the attitude that a judge by the name of Eli had. Samuel was a young boy serving at the tabernacle under the tutelage of Eli and, and Eli knew that God had given a message to young Samuel. And Eli's message to Samuel was this, look, and, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, whatever God told you, don't hide any of it from me. I want to know every single thing that God said about that topic. And so I hope that's the, the attitude we have tonight as we approach the topic of repentance. It's for our good. It's in our best interest that we learn what God has to say about repentance. Now, just a side note to our note takers. My heart goes out to you. It's not a complicated lesson, but the major points are not brief, and they're not like Timmy, Tommy, Tommy, Tammy. They're not that easy. But if you'll take, what we're going to do tonight is, for each of the slides, for each of the points we're going to observe about repentance, we're going to start with the words, when we teach or preach about repentance, and, and then we'll fill in the blank with some. For example, we're going to start tonight by making this observation. When we teach or preach about repentance today, we are in good company. What, what I simply mean by that is, throughout the ages, God's faithful servants have spoken God's message about repentance. If we were to turn to the Old Testament books of the prophets tonight, and read from the writing of Jeremiah and the writing of Ezekiel and Amos and others, did they speak about the topic of repentance? And the answer is, yes, they did. What about the baptizer? The Bible says in Matthew 3, beginning in verse number 1, in those days came John the baptizer preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John preached about repentance. What about Jesus who started his preaching a little bit after John. Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, the words of Jesus. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Yes, 
Jesus spoke about repentance. On one occasion, Jesus sent his 12 apostles out to preach only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And part of that message we read in Mark 6 and verse 12, they proclaimed that men ought to repent. The apostles preached about repentance. After Jesus returned to sit at his father's right hand, and after Matthias and Paul were handpicked as the final two apostles, what about Paul? Did he ever touch on the topic of repentance? He's the one who proclaimed in Athens that God commanded all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17 and verse 30. So this idea of inquiring in the 21st century, is there any message from the Lord about repentance? We're not the first ones to contemplate that idea. And if we're teaching and preaching about repentance, we're certainly not the first ones to do that. And that puts us in pretty good company. Number two tonight, we need to understand, as we teach and preach about repentance, we're doing what the Lord wants us to do. In other words, it's God's will for people to learn about repentance. And it's not the function of the public school system. It's not the, it's not the function of the civil government. It's not their role to educate the world about repentance. That's the role of God's people. After Jesus rose from the dead in a number of different instances, he appeared to his followers and spoke to them on one occasion near the time that he was preparing to go back to heaven. On one occasion he spoke to them about the reality that the things that were written in the Old Testament, in the Law of Moses, in the Psalms and in the Prophets, actually pointed to Him. And in Luke 24, verses 46 and 47, we have these words of the Christ. And thus it is written, And thus it behooved the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. He, he said it's, it's the will of God that my followers proclaim a message of repentance in all nations, and the starting point for that is Jerusalem. Well, can we put our finger on the starting occasion when they first proclaimed repentance in Jerusalem? Sure we can, day of Pentecost. Question was asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? Answer given, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Repentance, remission of sins, proclaimed among all nations. We need to recognize, number three, that as we teach and preach about repentance, we're sharing a message that the world and the church need to hear. Somebody said, well, I understand the world needs to hear this, but why does the church need to hear? Hang on, we're going to get to it. But again, going back and thinking about the day of Pentecost. In that assembly, there were Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Acts 2 and verse number 5. And on that day with that great multitude assembled, those people who were outside of the Christ, did they hear that day about repentance? They sure did. They were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Without that for uh, repentance, there would be no forgiveness. One chapter later in Acts chapter 3, we read that John and Peter went up to the temple to heal a lame man, and as a result of that healing, a bunch of people came to the temple. And there Peter took that opportunity and preached, and part of that message was, repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, Acts 3 and verse number 19. Go back to Acts 17. The occasion was Paul was in the city of Athens. He was given a special invitation to go to Mars Hill. And there as he proclaimed the God of heaven as the Lord of heaven and earth, he said God commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17 and verse number 30. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And every lost person in the world deserves and needs to hear that message. Well, what about the church? The church also needs to hear what the Bible says about repentance. He used to be a sorcerer. 
But then he heard the message that Philip proclaimed in Samaria, and the Bible says that Simon himself believed and was baptized. We're talking about Simon who once was a sorcerer. And Simon was fascinated when he saw the power of Philip to do miracles. But it wasn't long until John and Peter came down there and they began to lay hands on those new disciples and the result was those new disciples received miraculous power from the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that, he said, man, I'm willing to pay money for that. I'll pay money to have that power so that I too can lay hands on others. And Peter said, no, no, no. He said, you think the gift of God can be bought with money? He said, your heart's not right. He said, repent and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven. The Acts 8 in verse 22. That was a message of repentance for one who was a member of God's church. Look with me if you would in the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 12, and if you turn there, uh, please don't leave 2 Corinthians. I'm going to mention another passage, but as soon as we deal with 2 Corinthians 12, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 7. But at the very end of 2 Corinthians 12, Paul makes it known that he plans. He plans to come to Corinth and make another visit. And he basically tells them, before I come, in our language, some of y'all need to get your act cleaned up. And if you don't get your act cleaned up before I get there, I'll deal with it when I get there. And he uses the word repent. Look in your Bible in chapter 12, verse 20, and then 21, verse 20. For I fear, lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not. Lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. And lest when I come again my God will humble me among you, and that I shall be well many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication or sexual immorality and lasciviousness which they have committed. In, in other words, Paul's appeal for them is, before I arrive, fix what needs to be fixed. If you're still living in these sins, repentance needs to take place. Now, turn back, if you would, to chapter 7. And as you're turning there, let me mention another message to a different congregation. It was a message from Jesus to the church in Ephesus. I'm not talking about the book of Ephesians. I'm talking about a portion of the book of Revelation. A book that was written to the seven churches of Asia. And the very first of those seven churches whom the Lord addressed was the church in Ephesus. And the message of, I'm sorry, of Revelation 2, verses 4 and 5 to the church in Ephesus was, remember from where you have fallen. Repent and go back and do the first works. And so if you change the wording, go back and do, into the word return, you got three R's right there in Revelation 2. That was the formula for them getting back on track. Remember, repent return. Did the church in Ephesus need to hear that message about repentance? It sure did. And so as we teach and as we preach and as we discuss the topic of repentance, that's a message that the church and the world both need to hear. Well, as we talk about repentance, it's essential that we help those whom we are trying to teach, that we help them understand just what repentance means. I, I've not kept a record, but out of the people whom I've taught through the years, when we come in our study to the topic of salvation, specifically 
the topic of repentance. I'm not trying to make them squirm. I'm not trying to put them on the spot. I'm not trying to make them feel uncomfortable. But I often just casually ask the question, well, what do you think repentance is? And for those who have given an answer, the overwhelming majority of those who have answered have said repentance means confess your sin. That's not what repentance means. I know for a child of God who's gone astray and wants to come back and be reconciled to God, in that process there must be confession of sin and there must be repentance. But as I'll show you in a moment, confession of sin and repentance, those are two different concepts. So you've got the noun repentance, you've got the verb to repent. In the New Testament, the, the word to repent or the words to repent simply means for a person to change their thinking about sin. And that results in a change in their behavior. It takes place in the mind, between the ears, and fruit or evidence is given in the change that comes forth in their life. Now, I mentioned a moment ago something about confession of sin. Let's be clear. There are some things that are not the same as repentance. When a person makes a mistake and they feel sorry that they've made that mistake, that's not necessarily repentance. I gave you all that time. Did you find 2 Corinthians chapter 7? You got it? Okay. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And I understand, I'm reading from the King James, I understand that the, the reading of the New King James and others be a little bit different. In fact, it's clear in my estimation. But if you look in chapter 7, verse number 9, verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that she were made sorry, but that she sorrowed, to repentance. In other words, your sorrow led to or resulted in repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us or nothing. Now here's our main thought in verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh or produces repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of. That's not, that is not regretted. But the sorrow of the world worketh or produces death. Now, when you look at verse number 10, don't you see a couple of different kinds of sorrow mentioned in verse 10, right? You've got one kind of sorrow that's identified as godly sorrow, and then you've got another kind of sorrow that's mentioned that's described as what? Sorrow of the world, or you might call that worldly sorrow. And so just because a person regrets doing something, just because a person feels badly that they've done something, that's not necessarily repentance. You see there in verse number 10, you've got this concept, godly sorrow, number one, produces what? What's it produce? Repentance. So godly sorrow and repentance, they're not the same. Godly sorrow leads to or produces repentance unto what? Salvation. Now, you may have encountered some individuals who want to bypass repentance and go straight to salvation. Uh, that's not how it works. You don't bypass godly sorrow and get straight to repentance. It's godly sorrow that, that results in repentance, the changing of the mind about sin, that leads to salvation. Now, he said, well, what would be a circumstance? What would be a possible scenario where someone might regret what they've done, but it's not godly sorrow? It's not repentance. Well, they might regret that they've done something because they got what? They got caught. They got caught by mom or dad. They got caught by the principal. They got caught by the coach. They got caught by the boss. They got caught by the police. But if they hadn't got caught, they'd still be doing it. So it's godly sorrow. The idea that I've broken God's heart and I've broken God's law and that kills me. And so I'm determined that I'm not going to do that again. Repentance. That leads to the fruit 
of repentance and, and salvation. Here's the second thing that repentance is not. Repentance is not simply changing our life for the better. Now, changing our life for the better, that certainly happens when someone repents. But simply because somebody makes a, a decision to make choices that are better doesn't mean they're repentant. Here's a, a, a player. She or he was on a team, and they've already been suspended for three games or three matches. And if they get busted again for drinking or smoking pot, they're off the team. And so they make up their mind, last game of the season, March 25th. I'm staying clean till March 25th. They change their behavior. No drinking, no pot for the next eight weeks. Have they changed their conduct for the better? Sure have. What's the motivation? Please God and go to heaven? It has nothing to do with God. They did it for themselves. Right? Or he's, he's dating this young woman and he's been coming to services and he knows if he's going to get in good with her, he's got to clean up his language, not to mention his truck. <laughs> he's got to clean up a lot of things. And so he changes. Not because he feels badly about committing sin, not because he wants to please God, be saved and go to heaven. He changes so he can get him a girlfriend. That's not repentance. Now, we mentioned a minute ago that confession of sin is not the same as repentance. Let me give you a Bible example. When you study the Bible, if you, if you Google or you could, and you print in or type into some online Bible concordance, type in the words for the Bible, look for, I have sinned. And you'll find a number of different individuals who made that statement. Now, in the case of David you'll see a man with a contrite heart who wants to correct that thing. But I have in mind another person. The mighty monarch of ancient Egypt in the days of Moses. The Bible calls him Pharaoh. Pharaoh was miserable. God was firing plague after plague at the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh and his people were miserable. And we read in chapter 9 that he calls in Moses. You know what he said to Moses? I have sinned. He said, Moses, talk to your God. Get rid of this plague. Get rid of this plague. So Moses went and talked to God. God took away the plague. And as soon as the plague was gone, what did Pharaoh do? Pharaoh went back to being Pharaoh. <laughs> he hardened his heart even more. So what he got in the case of Pharaoh there in Exodus 9? An example of a person who confessed his sin but had no intention of making any type of change. Asking for the prayers of the church is not necessarily repentance. One might ask for the prayers of the church because of health, because of some type of struggle, Need for strength, going on a trip. A person might ask for the prayers of the church for a number of reasons. Asking for the prayers of the church is not the same as repentance. Suppose we see a person in the parking lot of the church building. And we see Bubba walk from this side of the parking lot to the other side of the parking lot. Do we conclude by seeing him move his body from one point of church property to another point of church property that he's repented? If we saw Bubba walk from the front of the auditorium to the back of the auditorium, would we conclude he repented? No. If Bubba walks from his pew to the front of the auditorium, do we conclude that he's repented? Not yet. Moving a body from one place to another is not the same as repentance. Now, maybe that Bubba makes confession of sin, makes it known that he's repenting, good for him. But coming forward is not the same as repentance. And let me make this observation as we move on. Making improvement in our lives is not the same as repentance. Now, repentance is going to manifest itself in fruit or evidence. John the Baptizer told the Jews of his time, bring forth fruit, meat, or befitting repentance. Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 8. But making improvements 
doing better. That's not the same as repentance. Let me give you a Bible uh, verse to think about. James 1, a message written to Christians. James 1 and verse 20 is the idea that the wrath of man does not work or produce the righteousness of God. In the very next verse, verse 21, here's the message to Christians. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness, and superfluity of naughtiness, I think the New King James says, overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now, if you listen to that verse or you turned and read that verse, let me ask you this. In that verse we just quoted or you just read, what part of their wickedness, if they're engaged in something wrong, what part of their filthiness or wickedness did the Holy Spirit through James call on them to lay aside or get rid of? Well, what's the answer? All. God's appeal to His children who have gotten involved in something inappropriate is not reduce your misconduct. It's not Him. God's appeal is not simply do better. God's appeal is Get rid of it, all of it. Look, we all understand. Each of us, with no exception, each of us is a work in progress. Each of us has aspects of life in which we could make improvement. But God's standard when it comes to, if it's repentance, God's message is, Get rid of the sin. Uh, all of it. Okay? Now, let's go on to the next thought here. I know this is really long. We're sorry, note takers. You know, if Paul says sorry and then he laughs, he's not really sorry. <laughs> uh, I didn't really think about that aspect of the lesson until today. But when we're teaching and preaching about repentance, we're helping folks learn about God's goodness and His desire for them to be saved. You say, well, I've never really thought about connecting repentance with God's goodness. Let's turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans 2. Romans 2, your Bible may have a heading, I don't know, but in Romans 2, verses 1 through 16, in general, this section deals with the judgment of God. Okay? The judgment of God. For instance, in, in verse number Two, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth, and so on. Verse 3, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such thing, and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. I, I read those verses just so you could see, yes, this is a section that deals with the judgment of God. Now, look, verse 4 is our verse. Verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? It's in the form of a question. And the question basically is don't you know that God's goodness leads you to repentance? It's in the form of a question, but it actually involves a declaration. What is it? God's goodness leads people to repentance. Does that mean that everyone is ready to embrace God's goodness and comply with God's word? No, it doesn't. But God's goodness is a factor in getting people to repent. You say, okay, preacher, how is it that God's goodness plays a role in getting people to repent. Paul didn't explain, but we know this. God, because of His goodness, He wants what's best for every single human being, right? God, because of His goodness and His love, He wants every person to be saved. 
And God, because of his goodness and because of his love, sacrificed his son that through the blood of Jesus, remission of sins could be available. And God, because of his goodness and because of his love, gave us the instruction manual about how to respond to that goodness and be saved from our sins. And when people hear that message of salvation through the love of God, the cross and sacrifice of Jesus, it moves some people to be humbled and repent. Not everybody. But it gives us an opportunity as we teach and preach about repentance to remind people about the love and the goodness of God. God's not calling on us to repent just so he can show that he's got authority to call on us to repent. He's calling us on, to, on us to repent because it's for our own good. And we need to help them see that repentance is part of man's proper response to God's message about salvation. We've already quoted it. You've known it forever, basically. God's not willing that any should perish. He didn't want anybody to perish, but that all should what? Come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. Now, we've not said it and we'll not spend a half hour on it, but as we talk about repentance, we need to understand, and the people whom we teach need to understand, repentance is not optional. It's mandatory. Now, if you're 15 years old and you want to go down and get a driver's permit, you don't have to repent. It's not required. If you're of age and you want to get married in order to get a marriage license, you don't have to repent. If you want to graduate from college or get your GED, graduate from high school, you don't have to repent. But if a person wants to have the forgiveness of sins, please go ahead and go to heaven, then repentance has to take place. Luke 13, 3. I tell you, neighbor, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. No repentance, the result is what? Perishing. Again, we think about Acts 3 and verse 19. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Again, at least a third time, God commanded all men everywhere to repent. Or God commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17 and verse 30. And so repentance is a command. It's not our command. It's not a command that's trickled down for some, from some church council. It's a command from the God of heaven. And so, whether you know, I, I've taken both approaches. I've taken the approach in, in teaching people as we talk about repentance. I've taken the approach, first let's read verses on repentance that show it's mandatory. Now then, what does that mean? God wants me to do it. What does it mean? Or sometimes... We've talked first about what repentance means, and then we've turned and looked at verses which show that it's mandatory. But mandatory it is. It was mandatory before we were born, and it's going to be mandatory until the end of the world. God said so. Common sense. As, as we talk to people about repentance, common sense is good in thinking about when and how we present what the Bible says about it. Over 40 years ago, wow, over 40 years ago, I was working at a building supply company in, in Florida. And one of my co-workers was a student in a local denominational cemetery, I mean seminary. And at lunchtime, he would change out of whatever t-shirt he had on put on a white shirt and a necktie and go out right in front of the store was a traffic light with two-way traffic, two lanes going both directions. He'd go out there and scream, the car, repent! So what do you do? Throughout his lunch break, scream at the, at the passengers in the vehicles to repent. Do people need to repent? Yeah. But you know, when Jesus sent the apostles out to preach, he said, you need to be harmless as what? Wise as serpents are harmless as doves, right? Use some common sense as you approach people, Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 26. Think about um, the day of Pentecost. 
Did Peter on the day of Pentecost present a message of repentance? Yeah, he did. But before he presented that message of repentance, he had laid a foundation. He'd quoted from the Old Testament prophet Joel, say, hey, what's happening today? It's fulfilling prophecy. He told them about Jesus doing great miracles. He quoted from David in the book of Psalms saying, what happened with Jesus being raised from the dead? Fulfilling of Old Testament prophecy. So he had laid the foundation. Peter, or Peter said, you, you need to know that, that God has made Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, Acts 2.36. So now then when they ask the question, what do we do? Repentance comes. But he first laid the foundation. Or think about the Apostle Paul as we read in Acts 17 when he spoke not to a Jewish audience but a Gentile audience. Unbelievers there in Athens. What did he talk about? He said, well, there's a God you don't know about. And I'm going to tell you about that God. He made the heavens and the earth, Acts 17, 24. He's the Lord of heaven and earth, Acts 17, 24. He gives to all men life and breath and all things, Acts 17, and verse 25. Paul, what are you doing? I'm laying the foundation. And then he gave the message that he commands all men everywhere to repent, verse 30. And so we need to have common sense as we connect with people and approach them about the topic of repentance and also how we do it. We ought to do it with the spirit of what? Sadness for what sin is. With the sense I'm not apologizing, but also we need to present it, present the truth in love. Now I'm going to just mention this one. I got to go on because I want to spend some time on the next one. This really ties in with what we just said. When we talk to people about repentance, they need to see in us that we really care about them. They need to see that we're not just lamb blasting them. We're not nailing them to the wall, but we really care about them. You remember we read a little while ago in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul said, you got these issues and you need to repent before I come. Go back up in that chapter a few verses prior to that. Go back up in, on your time and look back up in chapter 12 and about verse 15. Paul said, I gladly spend and am spent for you. He said, the more I love you, the less I'm loved. What, Paul, what are you saying? I'm, I'd give anything for you, and I love you. You know, when people know that we care about them, they're more open to hearing a message about repentance. Now, application. This is where we lock the doors and say, let's stay a few more minutes. If I talk about repentance, but I never make application, then I'm really not getting done what I need to get done. So, so the question is, how does this repentance thing work in real life? Well, in the days of Ezekiel, God said to those who were living in wickedness, He said, if you've robbed somebody, you return what you stole. Ezekiel 33 and verse 15. So for those, Bubba, if Bubba's been thieverizing, he needs to stop thieverizing and give back what he thieved. He needs to give it back. That's what he needs to do. If Bubba's a married man and he's been misusing, he's been abusing his wife, and he's not loving her like Jesus loved the church, Ephesians 5, 45, and he is emotionally and mentally and physically abusing her, what Bubba needs to do is not cut down on that abuse. No, sorry. Bubba, you cut it out 100%. Now that would be repentance if it comes from a heart of God in this heart. And Mrs. Bubba, if she's been lying right and left to Bubba, what does she need to do about that line? She needs to not reduce her lies. She said, I usually tell three a week, I'm going to cut down to one. That's not good enough. Get rid of lies, Mrs. Bubba. Apologize for lying. Set the record straight. Now that's the application. If mom and dad are servants of Jesus and they have time to do this with their kids and do that with their kids and do this with their kids and do that with their kids, but they never take the time to give spiritual training to their kids. 
they need to repent of their failure to do the most important thing in the lives of their children. And those teenage children, when that teenage daughter or son, when Bubba's daughter or son says, Dad, I hate your guts. And when I turn 18, I'm out of here and I'm never, ever coming back. I hope I never see you again. Whoa. You saw oh, that would never happen. It absolutely happens. Repentance would require that child not to tone down their message, but to absolutely apologize for what they said, remove that type of language, and stop it right there. If someone's living in a relationship that God identifies as adultery, the only way to stop making that be adultery is get out of that relationship. What's the appeal? Come out from among them and be separate. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 17. That would be the application of repentance. Not simply saying we shouldn't be in this relationship. Cut off that relationship. A Bible class teacher. Bubba, you're a Bible class teacher. And I don't mean to be insulting, but Bubba, it's pretty obvious you're not preparing well for your class you're teaching. Well, we've been to Disney World a couple times this year. and I've been repainting the fence and doing a lot of it. Bubba, repent. You're letting down the people in your class. You're letting yourself down. You're letting your Lord down. We're not asking you to stop teaching. We're simply saying, repent, acknowledge what you've done, and don't do it again. Bubba, if you're a preacher, if you're just coasting, you're just coasting and collecting paychecks, but you don't really love the souls of men, you need to repent. I'm not asking you to stop preaching. I'm asking you to change your mind and change your conduct. Bubba, you're a deacon, and you're never carrying out your assignments. We're not asking you to step down. We're asking you to step up and be the man the congregation thought you were when they chose you to be a deacon and fulfill your assignments. Acknowledge what you've done. Change your mind about sin and fix it. Bubba, you're an elder, and you can't... Remember the last time, maybe it was even B.C.? You know what that is, right? Before COVID? <laughs> maybe it was B.C. is the last time that you ever visited a member of the congregation to show concern for their spiritual weakness. Sir, we're not asking you to step down. The congregation has placed their hands, their souls in your hands, help lead them to heaven. But sir, you need to repent. Change your mind about what you're doing and fix it. And then we close tonight by this thought. If we teach or preach about repentance, we're not going to be the most popular praised person in the world. But you know what? That's not what we're after, right? We wouldn't, let me say this. We should never, should never say anything or teach anything with the intention of hurting people's feelings and making people upset. But the reality is when we teach the truth and when we live the truth and when we stand against what's right, wrong and stand up for what's right, some people will not be happy about that. They weren't happy when Jesus spoke about repentance. They killed some of the prophets when they spoke about repentance. You know what caused John the baptizer his life and, and so we would expect to have that same today. Now, I'm not going to review all, how many points were there? Anybody keeping notes? How many? Somebody said 10. I never tell people in advance, I got 10 points. We'd have, we'd have to call 911, there'd be so many heart attacks. But hopefully these things tonight have helped us to focus on the concept of repentance. Yep, the Lord has spoken about repentance loud and clear. May we have a joy in reading what God says. And may we have a heart that loves Him so much that we want to be like Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when he said, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Thanks for your attention.